Welcome to tonight's live stream. I'm going to get the stream started in a minute. I just want to get let everybody know the live stream is going on. Okay, we are now on with the live stream, and tonight's topic is going to be reparations and the buffer Negroes trying to stop reparations. Now, the reparations movement is a grassroots movement created by black people on the ground in the hopes of making the United States government give it compensation for the racism they encountered during slavery, the oppression they experienced during Jim Crow, and the ongoing discrimination and racism Black people encounter that prevent Black people from being able to compete in America economically and be able to actualize their potential as American citizens. So I believe in the reparations movement for American descendants of slaves, because when it comes down to American descendants of slaves, they have been prevented and hindered and even impeded by your white supremacists, non-blacks, and others who have benefited from black labor during slavery and have benefited economically by destroying black businesses through things like the welfare state of the 1970s, things like the drug laws of 1986, and even things like the 1994 crime bill, which imprisoned an entire generation of black men and incarcerated them in the prison industrial complex. So when it comes down to the United States government, they are accountable for a lot as related to the ongoing oppression of black people. And those black people who are descendants of slaves, they deserve to be not only compensated for what went on with slavery, but they should also be compensated for the discrimination that many have encountered and the efforts to sabotage black owned businesses and efforts to try to destroy generations of black people through things like these drug laws and these efforts to undermine efforts to even correct past discrimination like affirmative action. Because it seems like every time there are efforts to give black people their due in these United States, there's always some effort to try to undermine those efforts. I mean, the original thing after, after Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation was a plan to find all the slaves 
and send them to Liberia. That was the first plan they had to try to sabotage black people. And then after that, we had a bunch of these um, people out here. And what they were trying to do after that plan failed with Lincoln's assassination was go out here and then we had them forming this terrorist organization, the Ku Klux Klan, to try to destroy black people economically after they refused to give them their 40 acres and a mule. So we had a group of descendants of slaves who had those skills, um, like carpentry, metalworking, which was um, I believe blacksmithing, and they were all these efforts to undermine black people and no efforts to give them any sort of compensation for their oppression, even though they promised the 40 acres and a mule, they never gave us the 40 acres and a mule. And what happened was they decided they were going to find a way to get us back on the plantation with that Liberia plan, which blew up in their faces with Lincoln's assassination. And after that, we had a campaign again where the Democrats formed the Ku Klux Klan and wanted to terrorize black people. And they, when they terrorized black people, they went out of their way to burn their businesses, lynch educated and intelligent black men and women, and murder black families. So we had all these efforts to destroy the slaves in the post-slavery period of post-reconstruction. And then as time went on, we had cases like Plessy versus Ferguson and Dred Scott, which made it where it was the legal definition of the law that a black man would be considered a second-class citizen, not only in the South, which enacted Jim Crow laws to, to oppress black people, but it was also in the North where we had the same type of discrimination uh, um, presented against black people. And this was done systematically to black people and it prevented black people from being able to compete in the US economy. And that was really wrong because when it came down to America, America was primarily built by slaves for these white slave masters and those white slave masters benefited from black people building up their infrastructure and going out here and building and planting their crops and making these white people very wealthy. And they want to sit there and say, we don't want to give reparations, but you wanted to give reparations and compensation to other people. Moreover, you allowed other people to come into the country like the Greeks, like the Germans, like the Jews, and like the Italians, you allowed them all to come into America and you allowed them to leapfrog over black people and you allowed them an opportunity to be a part of America. You allowed them to have an American dream and you allowed them to have an equal opportunity at getting a part of America. But black people are told they don't deserve reparations, not only by your Republicans, like your Mitch McConnell, but they are also told they don't deserve reparations by your Democrats. And I believe that that whole argument is wrong. And the reason why I believe that argument is wrong is because America has waged war on Black people over the last, I say, 400 years. And even though they have given Black people some semblance of freedom, they have not given them an opportunity to actualize that freedom or actualize their potential as American citizens. Because when it comes down to many of these white people and non-Black people who have benefited from Black labor and Black people being in America, they don't want to compete with those black people. So they make efforts to try to undermine the black people wherever they go, whether it be with these discriminatory 
policies that they have right now in the job market or these um, biased laws in the criminal justice system that punish black people at giving them longer prison sentences than they would a white person and give them more charges than a white person or doing things like giving them a black people a substandard education or an education where they are indoctrinated into white supremacy. There have been efforts to keep black people from actualizing their potential because when it comes down to whites and non-blacks, they fear black competition in the American society as related to business and economics because most of these people need black people at the bottom of their world in order for their world to be smooth. Now, I've talked about this on numerous um, videos about their smooth world and these white racists needing black people at the bottom. And they need black people at the bottom so that they can feel comfortable at their place at the top because without those black people at the bottom, they can't feel secure about their white supremacist ideas of the world. So when you have black people talking about reparations, it makes all of these people uncomfortable because one, they know that they benefited from that black labor and two, they know that their smooth world is being disrupted by those black people coming out here and making demands for fair and equal compensation. And it would it is going to be fair and equal compensation for those black people from giving and giving them reparations is fair and equal compensation because the discrimination and the racism that people are suffering, we're not just talking about slavery and giving people compensation for slavery, but we're also talking about giving them compensation for what was done to them as related to the last 50 years, because in the last 50 years, we've had entire generations of black people not go out here and be able to actualize their potential due to the undermining of things like affirmative action, a program designed to deal with past discrimination as related to black men. However, that program was undermined by your white leftists who went out of their way to hire white women in large majorities and used white women as a buffer group to say they were all about diversity when in actuality they were looking for a way to continue to perpetuate white supremacy in corporate America and keep black men from becoming competitors at major businesses here in America. So you sit there and you talk about how you don't want to give rep, how you had affirmative action and how you have welfare and how these were reparations, but all of those programs have benefited white people. There's never been anything to directly benefit black people and to compensate black people for what they contributed to this country and to compensate them for everything that they have contributed to this country and to compensate them for all of the oppression and discrimination they have experienced in the 400 years black people have been here. I'm gonna, what's going on JJ? Glad to see you here. Glad to see your Nightingale Wednesday nightmare. Glad to see you here, Courtney X, Jerry Wilson, what's up? Um, Supremo, glad to see you here. Tanya Hack, glad to see you here. Thank you for the donation, Mad Lion. I really appreciate it. And Paul Johnson, that is true. Without black people, there would be no America as it is right now, because if it wasn't for black people's labor, we wouldn't have the America we have right now. We wouldn't have the foundation for most of America right now, because they got our labor for free and we weren't paid for that labor, our grandfathers and forefathers. And our currently, a lot of brothers and sisters can't even get into the job market because you have a buffer group of white women in front of the HR department and even some of these black women out here helping them keep talented young black men and black women out of the job market. And Kay Walker 98, what about the inventions made by black slaves? Yeah, that's, they deserve reparations for that too. 
And yeah, the Democrats aren't for reparations, neither are the Republicans. So glad to see you, LOM. And when it comes down to reparations, again, there is a history of this. I mean, after World War II, Jews and the Japanese who were in internment camps got reparations. And when it came down to the Jews who were here in America, they got reparations and we didn't even do anything to them. So there is a history of the U.S. compensating people for reparations for things they did to them in wars. So I believe it is equitable to go out here and compensate black people for everything that was done to them during slavery. And not only slavery, I believe black people need to be compensated because when it comes down to white racist America and white supremacist America, there has been an ongoing campaign even after slavery to try to undermine black excellence here in America. And to undermine that black excellence, we got groups like the Ku Klux Klan. We got denied access to union jobs in the North. We got denied an opportunity to even have our own businesses with the creation of the welfare state in the 1960s and the whole campaign to have black women join the feminist movement and create a single mother household, which destroyed the black family. Then we had in the 80s, the flood of drugs come into the black community. First, the heroin in the 70s, then the crack cocaine in the 1980s. And we saw efforts to undermine black people at every turn from not only your white people, but you're also your non-black people. And they all made money at the expense of black people. And when black people are sitting there saying, talking about getting fair compensation for all of the war waged on them, because that's what it was, it was war waged on us. Then we have everybody trying to deflect and bulk and none of their arguments make any real sense because when you listen to their arguments, they come across as excuses. Like for example, you have your Mitch McConnell who's sitting there talking about the election of Obama was reparations. And that's a BS argument because when it came down to the election of Barack Obama, that is not compensating black people for the discrimination that is going on right now, nor does it compensate black people for the discrimination that they have experienced in the past or the racism or the labor that you got for free here in this country to build your country. The election of Obama didn't do anything for black people. Basically, your Barack Obama was just a hand-picked flunky for your white leftists, and he was designed to go out here and tell people what they wanted to hear. He's no reparation. He's just a one of these buffer Negroes they bought out here to trot out to make it look like things were fair for black people, when in actuality, it was business as usual. So Mitch McConnell's deflection has no merit in terms of argument, because if you want to go with that argument, we can talk about the post-Reconstruction South, where we had the first black congressman, like Hiram Revels, and say that that was compensation and that was a reparation there. Now, those first five brothers back in the 1800s during the reconstruction period, they were elected when in those parts of the black community um, after the civil war. So that argument doesn't wash that Obama's election was reparations because we've all, we had black congressmen, we had even a black senator black then, and black mayors over black towns. And we had those people. So I look at that and that argument about Obama, that's just an excuse from that Mitch McConnell, who's nothing more than a coward and a way to try to avoid 
dealing with the reparations issue constructively and deal with the issue of reparations in a fashion that allows the topic to be presented to the congressional floor in a serious manner and addressed with proper policies that allow us to get to a financial number that will fairly compensate black people for all of the oppression they have suffered and continue to suffer under policies that were created by both your Democrats and your Republicans. And there needs to be a serious discussion because when I look at the way these politicians are trying to minimize the issue, it's clear to me that they aren't they're trying to find a way to get in front of it, and they're trying to find a way to try to make a way to get away from it. But we have to stay focused and keep on the road with this reparations argument, because when it comes down to black people, we deserve a, a fair compensation for everything that has been done to us and continues to be done to us as related to these policies out here, because what black people need to understand is that reparations isn't just about slavery. It is also about these ongoing policies that have gone on, whether it be, again, the establishment of the welfare state, which created the single mother households, the flooding of black communities with guns and drugs like heroin, and crack cocaine in the 70s and 80s, the complete divide between the black family that the feminist movement created and socially engineered the beta male and the ongoing discrimination that black people suffer even right now as related to the job market where your heterosexual black man like myself can run into discrimination in the job market and be denied a job even if he is qualified because these people who are running the HR department would rather hire a woman rather than hire a qualified man. And it's all about us getting that fair and equal compensation because black people were not allowed to get an equal opportunity in the United States because when we went out here and tried to build our own, like a town, like a Rosewood or a Black Wall Street, which proved that black people could go out here and compete because these white racists wanted to live in their smooth world where blacks were at the bottom, they would make efforts to try to destroy those black towns and they would go out here and use this white woman as an excuse to go out here and destroy those black towns, saying that they were defending the honor of this white woman who lied about being raped, when in actuality it was all an excuse so they could go out here and destroy this black town because it was a living, breathing testimony to how black people could go out here and build on their own without the dependence on a white slave master or a white sponsor in charge of them and over them. So that's the thing that, that reparations is going to deal with because black people were never given that equal opportunity to be a part of America, contribute to America, and that's because white people and non-black people feel inadequate about competing with someone they believe is less than them. And in order for them to have their smooth world, they make efforts to systemically keep black people at the bottom by denying them opportunities to come into the job market, denying them opportunities to go out here and start businesses, and do not and systematically trying to brainwash black people into believing that they're less than in things like their media, because when it comes down to their media, it is designed to make black people see themselves as beneath white people or see themselves as less than white people and non-black people. And it's designed to 
make people not think of black as on the same level because they don't want to compete with black people because the whole idea of competing with black people is something your white racists don't want to do because they know that if we go out here and present that standard that fits that that does not fit their narrative it shatters their whole idea of that smooth world that they have where whites are on top blacks are on the bottom everybody else is in the middle and they can live comfortably with that idea but when you take that narrative away that means that they actually have to go out here and work and that means they actually have to they can't sit there and rest on their laurels so a lot of these whites and non-blacks they need that idea of blacks at the bottom and when you have black people talking about reparations again that shakes up the take the hierarchy that your white supremacists have designed in this country and it makes them realize that that black people are calling for their due they're calling for fair compensation for all of the past things that have gone on so that they can start working towards building a future where they're not going to be at the bottom getting scraps after your undocumented immigrants your asians your hispanics your whoever else and your whites they're not going to take the scraps they're going to take their own money and then use that money to build their own community and that's going to tear the foundation out from under their smooth world and that's what's got everybody shook up about this reparations movement because it's not a movement led by these buffer negroes out here and that's why what we're seeing right now is people making efforts to try to get those buffer negroes in place to try to, to undermine the entire reparations movement. I've got 49 people in the chat and 50 people in the chat. So let's get those likes up. And if you guys want to donate to the super chat, I would really appreciate it. Um, right now I'm trying to, again, do some things. So I really would need you guys to get those likes up. I mean, we're at 49, 50 people in the chat. So I'm going to get back on this reparations topic because what's going on right now is we have a group of buffer Negroes who are trying to get in front of this whole reparations movement. And they want to try to get in front of it because they want to try to steer the reparations movement into a ditch but similar to what happened with the issues of the Black Lives Matter movement, which really wasn't much of a movement. But what they want to do is take the grassroots reparations movement and hijack it. So what they want to do is go out here and get these buffer Negroes from Hollywood to go out here and start talking about this issue. And then they want to get their hand-picked um, what is it, politicians to bring that topic to the table. So what they want to do is get this buffer group of buffer Negroes, like your Ta-Nehisi, as I call him, to Negro Coates, and your Danny Glover out here speaking on the issue. And these men have no business speaking on the issue of reparations. They are not economists. They are not um psychologists they are not social scientists so get prodding these negroes out does not help create an argument for reparations in fact what they're trying to do is minimize the argument for reparations by saying that the argument of reparations is not being presented by a group of intelligent black people but but it's presented by a group of these hand-picked buck dancing, bow jangling, step and fetch it Negroes. And what they want to do with these step and fetch it Negroes is have them get in front of the argument and make the case in front of Congress, not understanding that these guys know nothing about the cause of reparations and they have no interest in it. I mean, we if you want to talk about... Um, reparations. We need guys like Dr. Claude Anderson, like Paul Johnson has said. We need guys who are historians, intellectuals. I mean, I, even I would like to see David Carroll get up there and talk about this. 
if he was interested in it. So these are men we need to have. I mean, these are people who know the history. I mean, if Dr. Crest Welsing was still alive, she would be someone who I would want to hear from as related to reparations. I don't want to hear from some Hollywood buffer Negroes talking about how they're going to address the issue of reparations because these same Negroes were the ones who benefited under the white supremacist economic system. They have gotten crumbs from the master's table. They have gotten opportunities from their slave master for buck dancing and bojangling. And they have gone out here and they have benefited from things. So how can they speak on the issue of reparations? They have not suffered as the res like many brothers suffered, like during the crack epidemic, like I did. And they still don't haven't suffered from discrimination like I suffered when I went out here and tried to get a civil service job for the CUNY office assistant many years ago, about 10 years ago. They don't know the struggles of black people and they don't know the issues going on on the ground with black people like these public schools where we have all these white teachers on the job here in New York City and no black teachers in the classroom. So they don't know what's going on here. They just go get out some buffer Negroes and have them talk on the issue. And they think that by getting the buffer Negroes out here and having these farce of a hearing of a hearing, because that's what your Congress was trying to do. They weren't even talking about a hearing. They wanted to just have a hearing to have a hearing, which really was not a discussion because they believe that black people are incredibly stupid. And they believe that if they make these superficial movements, what it will do is black people will feel like something is being done, but there's no action actually being taken for the things. Um, and when it comes down to that, we are past that as I see it, because a lot of people, they woke up from the horrible eight years of Barack Obama, and they see past this game that both the Democrats and Republicans are trying to play with black people. Because with Barack Obama's presidency, black people did not get any hope, black people did not get any change. And when we saw your Barack Obama and Eric Holder do absolutely nothing about George Zimmerman, we started to see that when it came down to your Barack Obama, that he was nothing to us. He was not, he didn't care about us. And he was a part of a group of black elites who were all about protecting their benefits and what they got from the white mas slave master's table, but they weren't about helping the black community. And that's where we started to see an effort to go out here and people starting to make movements of their own because they realized that groups like the Democratic Party were not acting in their best interest. And what's going on here with this reparations movement is the, the politicians want to get these buffer Negroes up in front of it, and they want the buffer Negroes to go out here and just sit there and tell the black masses what they want to hear, that I represent the black community, I am testifying on your behalf, and I'm going to tell Congress about things when in actuality it's all scripted drama and people saw through that because it was all about a hearing for a hearing and then they, what they want to do is get black people to think that these people are doing something for them and then go out here and trot out your Corey Buffer Booker or your KKK Kamala Harris out here and have those guys be the candidates that black voters go for before they trot out your Joe Biden, who was nothing more than one of the architects of the destruction of the black community, because it was your Joe Biden who was out here going out here and trying to keep segregation in schools in the North and went against busing. It was your Joe Biden who created the 1994 crime bill. It was your Joe Biden who was out here 
and he was out here and he created these drug laws in 1986. So what they want to do is get everybody back on the Democratic plantation by having these superficial hearings and then get black people back to vote for these leftist candidates. And they want to do this because this is something that they need to do because when it comes down to the left, they want to be Trump. And when it comes down to the right, the right wants to try to table the issue of reparations because they want to try to just win based on the large base of white women they have going on right now. And they don't think that they need the black vote. So neither side wants to deal constructively with reparations. Neither side wants to go out here and have a serious discussion on it. But what's really making a lot of these guys nervous is the fact that large majorities of black voters are staying home. And those black voters are staying home because they see nothing to the political process that benefits them. And when we look at the eight years of Barack Obama, the first black president, black people, again, got nothing out of that deal. So the issue of reparations is one that is that needs to be discussed because it shows where the black vote actually stands. Because as it stands right now, if we can't get these Congress people to take us seriously, so if they can't, if they don't take us seriously, then why should we vote for either party? If they're going to minimize our issue and minimize our cause, which is reparations, which is fair compensation for the over hundreds of years of oppression, slavery, discrimination, and ongoing discrimination, this, this shows that they take the black vote for granted. And if you're going to take the black vote for granted, then we don't need to participate in this election. We'll just deal with four more years of Trump and you guys can go on with whatever you are going to go on. And that's the message black people need to send to these politicians who think they're going to bring these buffer Negroes out here like this former NFL player with the concussion injuries that Artel Jeffries was talking about, this coon who was dancing in his underwear, basically, this guy is a joke. I mean, if you look at those guys, they had testifying, again, these weren't people that anybody would take seriously as related to a congressional hearing. Again, when I think about people I would take seriously at a congressional hearing, Again, I would think about people, again, like the late Dr. Francis Crest Welsing, um, even people like your Umar Johnson, and even people, um, Dr. Charles Sowell, I mean, I would take him very seriously. Those are people I would take seriously in a discussion about reparations because they're going to present historical facts. They're going to talk about the historical documentation of the timeline. They're going to talk about the economic benefits that America has received by destroying the black family, destroying black owned businesses, destroying, creating the welfare state, socially engineering single parent households. And this is an intellectual discussion that would stimulate people's minds and give them some perspective on things but instead, what we had in that farce of a hearing is your Ta Negro Copes, as I call him, talking on a pseudo intellectual level. We had your Danny Glover coming out here and playing the, the hat in hand Negro. Then we had this buck dancing dude in a pair of drawers, who's dancing his, his, his hallmark is dancing in a pair of drawers on a subway train, and a former NFL player. And this is not a consensus that shows any sort of seriousness as related to black issues. I mean, even, I don't know if Neely Fuller is still alive, but again, these are men who would give us a serious 
discourse that could be taken seriously. And we didn't have any of those people invited for that congressional hearing, which showed me that, thank you, Nelson, for the donation, that this hearing wasn't anything anybody needed to take seriously, and that this was a superficial gesture in the hopes of trying to pander for black votes and trying in an effort to try to get people back on a democratic plantation or republican plantation that both people black that most black people are leaving because when it comes down to a majority of black folks they saw where things went with obama and they saw that barack obama was the kind of politician who talked a good game but didn't deliver and that's what led to many people black people staying home in 2016, and it led to black people staying home in 2018. And I believe that more black people are going to stay home in 2020, because why should you vote in an election where the candidates aren't making you any offers to do anything for you, not make any offers to give you any sort of policies, or making any sort of offer to make any sort of changes to your benefit. They want your votes, but then they don't want to give you anything for your votes. And when it comes down to voting, you are voting in order to get political policies changed, and you're voting to get money for your communities. And to, for too long, Black people have just voted down tickets in order to support a candidate that does not support them. And this whole reparations issue really shows us all how little respect that either party has for black people. And that's what we're seeing with this whole reparations movement. And I'm gonna start going through the chats and look at them for a minute. Moli, I'm glad to see you here. Um, yeah, Ados doesn't have proper representation in politics. And yeah, we have the wrong people um, representing the movement. Again, we need to have our black intellectuals as part of this movement. We also need to have black business owners as part of it. And we need black historians as part of it. And that's something we desperately need for this reparations movement to get momentum because they could present a more constructive argument than what's being done now, because what's being done now is they're trying to go out here and trying to hijack the movement, and they're trying to hijack that movement so they can go out here and change the narrative of the movement and try to minimize the movement so that they can have the 2020 election and have the black vote sewed up as related to the election. Um, Myham 1994, asks, what does SJS, direct, SJS stands for? Well, SJS Direct is the, my publishing company, and it publishes books like John Haynes' Dark Succubus. And the SJS stands for Sean James's Stories, and the Direct is Sean James's Stories Direct to You. So that's what SJS Direct stands for. And this is my newest book, John Haynes' Dark Succubus, which is available on Amazon.com in paperback and ebook. And I would appreciate it if you guys went out here and picked up a copy. Um, I'm going to go through the chat some more. Yeah, they do need Dr. Claude Anderson, and they need Thomas Sowell. They need all those guys. Um, Nightingale Wednesday Nightmare or Buffer Negroes, Jesse Williams and Kamala Harris. Yes, they are Buffer Negroes. And when it comes down to Buffer Negroes, Buffer Negroes are any member of these elite classes, whether they be the Boule, whether they be Black Hollywood, your Buffer Negroes are designed to go out here and say that they have succeeded, they have accomplished, usually they come from these top schools, and they usually come out here to say, if I can do it, why can't you? And they're out here to tell you that there's something wrong with you when in actuality the system is working against you. They are just you know, tokens that they use to say that they're all about diversity, when in actuality, they're just puppets that they usually bring out here to try to pacify the black masses. And Barack Obama 
was a buffer Negro. He was a, another one of these buffer Negroes out here. And his job was to present the idea that, oh, I have arrived. And, if, and since we have a black president, then black people have equal opportunities in this country when that's far from the case. And usually what they do with these buffer Negroes is again, whenever black people start calling out for issues like reparations, they go and trot them out and then they have them speak and pretend to represent the black community and have them go out here and tell the black masses what they wanna hear and make black people feel good. But then in actuality, they go back to business as usual. So that's what a buffer Negro is. And that's what the Democrats and the Republicans are trying to do. Trot out all these buffer Negroes to go out here and have them go out here and get in the way of reparations and then have them try to re represent the argument for reparations and then when it fails, then have people sitting there blaming the buffer Negro for the problems, when in actuality, it was them just trying to get control over a grassroots narrative and control a grassroots narrative. Because that's what buffer Negroes go out here and do. They just out here to be the mouthpieces for these, polit these white politicians. And what they want to do is be that voice for them. But the whole way, the whole thing is everything that they're saying is what they're told to speak and they're not hearing the truth from the people. Um, okay, Joshua Davis asks, one white YouTuber used a black democratic politician who opposed reparations to justifies his point as an SJW issue. How would I respond to that? Well, when it comes down to reparations, reparations is not an SJW issue. It is not a left issue or a right issue. It is an issue that black people are bringing up because when they look at this country and they look at the opportunities that they have been denied, been denied systemically, they are sitting there and saying, I'm not getting what I deserve for being a part of this country. I mean, black people built this country during slavery. And then when they were given their freedom, they tried to go out here and have an equal opportunity only to be undermined and sabotaged by groups like the Ku Klux Klan, which terrorize black people, or to be denied jobs and equal opportunities in the North. Because in the North, yes, you could get a job as a porter, a janitor, or a chauffeur in, during Jim Crow, even if you had a degree from a place like Spelman or Morehouse, you couldn't be a lawyer or a doctor at many of these company, at many of these hospitals or these, um, even for the government. You couldn't work the job you got the degree in. You had to go out here and work these jobs because these racists didn't want to hire black people as lawyers doctors, engineers, scientists. They didn't want to hire black people for those jobs because they feared that, oh, if we bring this black man around these white women, the white women will lust after the black man and we won't get an opportunity to have a relationship with these white women. So that's why black men were denied jobs in places outside of black owned businesses and even when black people tried to have black owned businesses, we were attacked by the Ku Klux Klan or we were um, locked out of certain things or we were relegated to neighborhoods that were redlined. And even when we tried to buy homes, we were stuck in ghettos because your discriminatory housing policies kept black people from being able to buy the homes that they wanted live the lives they wanted and get that opportunity to be a part of the American dream and get that opportunity to be a part of America. So when I look at reparations, it is about compensating black people for everything and this whole 400 years, not just slavery because welfare was not compensation. Welfare was a way to, again, 
take black people out of the economy and keep people, black people from competing because what the welfare state was all about was sabotaging the black family by separate, by taking the black father out of the home and giving the black woman the welfare benefits and then having her raise her children in the single mother household where the children never grow up to actualize their potential. And even if they do finish school and do things like that, they go into a discriminatory job market where they are told they can't go out here and find, get the jobs that they're qualified for. And I can test to that because I have a college degree and I've been going out here for years trying to look for work. And what I run into is this HR brick wall where, yes, they will go out here and hire a handful of buffer Negroes here and there, but they won't give, but these buffer Negroes don't want me on their job because they don't want direct competition and they want to be the H nice, the head Negro in charge. So this fiefdom gets broken up when you have reparations because with reparations, black people get that fair compensation. And once they get that fair compensation, they can go out here and start building that life they wanted to have and start working towards actualizing their potential. Now that's the ideal that would come out of reparations. And some people think it's going to be like Chappelle if you were to get reparations, where people would be buying fried chicken. But I believe that if you give black people an opportunity, they would go out here and build businesses. They would build infrastructure and they would start working towards improving the quality of life in their communities. And that's something racists don't want to see because they benefit from black people being at the bottom of the world. And what would happen if you had reparations is there wouldn't be any Aramone stores, there wouldn't be any of these um, places, these foreigners getting businesses in black communities. It would be black people serving black communities and it would be something that would really change the entire economic system because an economic system is the way a nation allocates its resources and the US's, excuse me, economic system has allocated money in a way that has kept black people from enriching themselves and empowering themselves for at least 400 years. And when you talk about reparations, that changes the entire economic system. And that's why you see both Democrats and Republicans against the whole idea of reparations, because it means that money is no longer flowing out of the black community into white and non-black hands. What it means is that money is flowing to the black community and that an economic system would be created that would keep that money in the black community, similar to what's going on with the Asian community right now. Because what's going on with the Asian community right now is that that, that dollar cycles around at least four or five times before it leaves the community. And that allows that community to build wealth. And what, when you have a black dollar that usually goes, that set, we have 97% of black dollars leaving the black community and enriching others, that's something that is very impactful to the black economy. That's why the black economy is struggling because all the money that goes in, that comes into the black community goes out. And that $1.1 trillion in cash spending power and $2.2 trillion in credit spending power all goes out of the black community, but none of that money comes back in to the black community. And if we were to change the flow of those dollars, that would have a major impact on the black community. Um, John Wright asked the question, so why won't black millionaires and billionaires get the economic setup for the black community? And that's because they benefit from the economic system as it stands right now, because as it stands right now, they get their dollars primarily from the white economic system. And they like being these H nices at the top of that order. As long as they're making money and they can stay at the top and they don't want any competition because if you change the economic setup, 
these guys go to the bottom. And if other billionaires, like if we were to get our black people who were in IT or black people who were really, you know, good at television and media, these guys like Jay-Z would be at the bottom of the world because they are producers of entertainment, but they aren't creating anything as related to wealth. Um, yeah, Nightingale, Wednesday Nightmare. Yeah, we have 64 in the chat and 48 likes. Let's get those likes up to 64. I mean, at least let's just get them up to 50. I mean, let's get these likes up um, because those likes help the YouTube algorithm up because I don't believe this stream is going to get monetized. Um, but because I'm talking about some hard stuff here. So again, if you guys could put in um, some donations in the super chat or to the Patreon or the PayPal, it would be really appreciated. Um, so I'm going to leave a link to the Patreon so you guys can donate to the Patreon. Um, also going to leave a link to the Cash app. So when it comes down to economics, they don't want, they want to remain on top. These black celebrities, these athletes, these entertainers. But the whole thing is the big problem with that is these guys are rich. And what they want to do is keep wealth from coming to the black community because rich is just having money. Wealth is having fixed tangible assets that have value. And what they don't want to see is black people becoming wealthy because when you have black people becoming wealthy, what they do is, again, they start having economic power and then they can use that economic power to create political power. And that means that everybody is going to have to compete with black people and black people are either going to have a seat at the table or they're going to run the table because when it comes down to black people, we when we are left alone, we become masters of excellence. I mean, if we look at the NBA, we look at the NFL, if we look at boxing, if we look at um, the arts, when we are left alone, we, are, we become masters of a craft. And that's something that scares most of these racists out here because a lot of them can't compete when you have a level playing field and they can't compete when you have people who work hard to be excellent because they're used to being mediocre. So when you have black people who are coming up, this is something that terrifies people. And that's why the rep reparations argument scares a lot of people out there. Um, Luciano, what was your question? Um, if you're reading how can I get more educated on ec reparations from an economical power standpoint? Well, you get you can get educated by reading different articles, and you can also really get educated by watching guys like Professor Black Truth, and you can get educated by just reading about the history of the United States of America. Because in the history of the United States of America, we have a systematic racism where black people were denied opportunities to actualize their potential. And even when we tried to do it, we wound up getting undermined by numerous forces out here because they wanted to keep their smooth world. Should the reparations be paid by, it should be paid by the government, not by a political party, not by a corporation. It should be paid for by the United States government because the United States government was the one that benefited the most from you know, um, everything as related to the country and as black people's labor. And they were the ones who created the policies that kept black people from being able to actualize their potential because it was both Democrat and Republican parties, whether they be federal policies or state policies that kept black people from actualizing their potential, whether it be things like, again, the welfare state, things like the crime bill, things like the drug laws, like Rockefeller drug laws here in New York. All of these things were detrimental to the black community. And 
these were all things that need to be dealt with. Uh, Luciano, I don't think it will be abused by women like affirmative action and welfare because when it comes down to reparations, it's about giving both black men and black women compensation. And that's what it was about. It's about giving both because welfare was not a reparation. Welfare was, an, was a way to sabotage black people and keep them from competing by putting them on a modern day plantation known as the ghetto, because that's what the ghetto was. The ghetto was a plantation and it was designed to keep black people contained so that they would not go out here in the world they would not go out into the job market, and they wouldn't go out here and compete. So as long as black people were in these ghettos selling drugs to each other and killing each other, there was no problem. But once we started going to get our educations and starting to look for jobs, then we had a problem. Then the racists had a problem with black people because they didn't want to compete with black people. They wanted them to know their place and they wanted them to know their place in the smooth world. What's going on, Chris Brown? Um, Chris is the creator of Omega Black, some really positive black manga, which shows you a positive image of a black man and a black family. And it's available on Amazon.com and paperback, and it's available on Comixology. And you guys definitely have to pick that manga up because it's a really great story. And he's trying to get the third issue out, and I'm hoping he can get that third issue out because we need more content like that out here, just like with the John Haynes series and John Haynes Dark Succubus. And again, guys, I really would love to see you guys pick this book up and John Haynes, A Conversation with Death as well. Um, yeah, but I believe the government should be the one that pays for it. And also maybe a couple of car these corporations who have gone out here and gotten black, doll black labor and exploited it. Um, if we can prove it, it should be compensation because, again, Native Americans have gotten compensation with reparations. I mean, your Jews, your Japanese, they've all gotten compensation. And why can't black people get reparations from what's going on? Um, what's going on? I mean, it's just we've been around here before everybody else, but nobody wants to talk about compensating us whenever we start talking about compensation. They, then people get all defensive, but they've got money for everybody else except the black people who have gone out here and built the country and have contributed to the economy. Um, thank you, Rob IS. I more really had to go in depth with this week's videos. Um, really wanted to go in depth on the subject, especially the one of 1989, because I wanted people to understand the context of 1989, because a lot of people were watching Netflix is when they see us and as they sit here and watch when they see us They're just looking at it from the perspective of the four teenage boys and not understanding the historical context of What was going on during that time? I mean your Ava DuVernay did a great job with that series, but she left some context out as related to the the complete destruction of the black family with the crack epidemic and she didn't talk about the crime that was going on, nor did she really delve deep into why Corey Wise was staying out of school. And the reason why he was staying out of school is because those schools were war zones. And I talked about that in my novel, Spellbound. I talked about how those schools, you know, were war zones and it was literally a fight for your survival um, during that time. So, um, Rob, Rob I asked, I don't think, I don't know if black people will be asking for reparations 100 years from now, but we need to have a discussion on it today. And the whole thing is, is that the discussion people are trying to have on reparations is being undermined by a group of politicians who are trying to turn it into a joke. This is a serious discussion that I believe needs to have a serious discourse. And I believe we have the people to make that serious discourse like your Claude Anderson, like Thomas Sowell, and many others who are highly intelligent and can articulate an argument for it. And what I'm seeing is that you have people in Congress who are trying to turn it into a minstrel show, and they're trying to turn it into a minstrel show so that they can try to minimize the issue, dismiss the argument, 
and then try to get black people back on their political platform and vote for their candidates. And that's a real slap in the face to black people because you're showing that you don't take the black community seriously, you don't take the issues of the black community serious, seriously, and you treat your black voters like a joke. And this was the same argument that led to Hillary Clinton losing in 2016 because she took the black vote for granted and a lot of the black vote stayed home. And in 2018, we saw the same thing happen as related to the Democrats and the Republicans. Black people had even more reason to stay home because we all saw a bunch of Trump rants, but no sign of concrete plan of what was going to be offered to the black community for a vote. So they're sitting there trying to get the black vote and the black vote is saying, you're gonna have to bring something to the table and they wanna sit there and they're expecting black people to just sit there and just vote for them because they're not Trump. But that argument does not wash these days because people are saying to themselves, you're not Trump is not an argument. What we want to see here and what we want to see from you is a concrete plan of what you are going to offer us in return for your vote. What policies are you going to offer us? What kind of programs are you going to bring to our communities? What resources are you are going to bring to our communities? What you are going to offer in terms of policies and what are you going to do about issues as related to black unemployment? What are you going to do about these black men being brutalized by police officers? What are you going to do about these malicious prosecutions, which still go on because with the Netflix series, when they see us, they wanted to talk about the Central Park Five. But I can bring up Chanel Lewis, the young man who was mentally disabled and was prosecuted and convicted for the murder of Karina Vertrano, a crime I know this young man did not commit. And I can also talk about Bill Cosby, who was railroaded by the criminal justice system for a sexual assault that he did not commit. So the policies are still there. And why should we continue to vote for these pol political parties that aren't going to change the policies to deal with these issues, it's just better off for black folks to just stay with Trump because you are not offering us anything different and what your candidates are no different than Michael Dukakis and Walter Mondale back in 1984 and 1988. And you hear a lot of these SJWs talk about how the internet is becoming like 1984. Well, the irony is, is I believe we're gonna get a 1984 but it's going to be Reagan Mondale 84, where your Walter Mondale was destroyed by Ronald Reagan and won 49 states. Whereas I'm going to see that happening if they bring your Joe Biden or whoever, Trump is going to win 49 states and that we're going to get the exact same 1984. And a lot of people are going to be sitting there wondering how that happened. And it happened because people keep taking the black vote for granted and they keep trying to pander to black people instead of trying to listen to the platform that is being built. And I believe that the ADOS platform is something that um, is really viable. And I believe we can use that as a way to start building a platform because you have to sit there, you're gonna sit there and tell us what you're gonna give us. No, it's, it's time for people to start telling the politicians what they want because they're the ones voting for them and we're the ones you need to come to. I mean, you represent us, we don't represent you. And when it comes down to the black community, that has been the standard for over a couple of decades. They've sat there and said, oh, we, we, we represent black people and we just take them for granted. We don't really give them anything. And now when black people are demanding things, you wanna dismiss us. So if you wanna dismiss us, then you deserve to lose elections. So um, Rob I asked, did Walter Mondale have racist tendencies? I don't know if he had racist tendencies, but I know that he was a very 
arrogant candidate. I mean, he was the vice president of Jimmy Carter. He tried to push a diversity initiative where he had Geraldine Fornaro, the first woman vice president, and it all fell apart on them because Ronald Reagan did the morning in America and he straight destroyed Walter Mondale. And then four years later, George H.W. Bush destroyed Michael Dukakis. And when I look at your um, Donald Trump, I believe what he's going to do is he's going to destroy Joe Biden if they send him out there the same way George H.W. Bush destroyed Michael Dukakis by beating him up on that crime bill the same way George H.W. Bush beat the crap out of Michael Dukakis on that Willie Horton situation because Joe Biden was the one who created the policies that led to a lot of black suffering and led to the destruction of black families and led to so many black men and women winding up in prison for years on mandatory minimum sentences and winding up in jails for years. And then you're Kamala Harris, who was one of the proponents for the three strikes law and did draconian policies. She was out here and she's gonna fall apart because again, you're coming out here talking about you're a black candidate, but you went out here like Barack Obama, disrespecting black people. So I see where both of them are going to fall. And when it comes down to them, they aren't viable candidates. And they and there's people are looking at them and saying, look, these guys just aren't strong enough to take on Trump. And it was said is, again, as I've always stated, Trump is a beatable candidate. But when it comes down to them, they don't have an argument. And then they go out here and make a mockery of something like reparations. Because to make that mockery of reparations the way they did by trotting out these buffer Negroes and that minstrel who was dancing in his drawers on a subway train, that really was an insult to large black voter, the large black voting base. And it treats black people's issues like it's something that they don't have, they, they don't care about. And that hurts both parties because both parties show how little regard they have for black people and black movements like reparations and ADOs. And that's something that's, well, that's gonna turn a lot of black people away from the political process. Because if you're not gonna take us seriously, then we can just stay home in 2020. Um, thank you, Nicole Diaz, for the donation. I really appreciate it. We can stay home in 2020 because there's no real incentive to vote for someone unless they're going to give you something. I mean, if you're not going to, when it comes down to um, election day, election day is payday. And it's about black people getting paid for the support of a candidate. And we sent him to go out here and get our policies put up for vote and to just get those those things passed in and made into policy. So that's what black people want. And if we're not going to get that from either side, then it's time for us to go create our own political party and go out here and create our own political platform. Um, Luciano asks, how do I feel about certain black conservatives opposing the reparations? Well, I feel it's time for us to go out here and vote those black conservatives out of office, because if they're not going to support our reparations cause, which is a fair and just cause, then it's time for us to get rid of these buffer Negroes. Because as I see it, it's these buffer Negroes who want to get in the way of things like reparations. It's these buffer Negroes who want to go out here and make excuses because they benefit from the current system. And because they benefit from the current system, they want to sit here and, continue, and try to undermine movements like reparations. They want to go out here and trot out entertainers and athletes and have them be representatives of the black community, when in actuality, they don't represent us and they don't represent what we want to do as related to the black community. Rob, I asked, what do I think are in terms of a dollar figure? 
I'm thinking it's going to be at least a couple of trillion dollars as related to reparations. It's a fair amount. I mean, if we talked about five or six trillion dollars, that would be a fair start number for reparations for black people because we're talking about centuries of discrimination and ongoing policies that present prevent black people from actualizing their potential. And we're also talking about opportunities that black people were denied in the job market. And thank you, Governor of the Death Star for the donation. I really appreciate it. Um, if you guys want to donate to the Super Chat, again, you can donate through the Super Chat or you can donate through the Cash App, the PayPal, or the Patreon um, because this this stream is not going to get monetized. I'm sure it's not going to get monetized. Um, um, lift every voice. I believe we should demand not only from the U.S. government, but also these other countries as well because they all benefited from black slave labor. And if we can go after them, but well, we have to start with the U.S. first and then go after these other countries because they all benefited from the transatlantic slave trade. They all benefited from keeping black people out of the job market. They all benefited from keeping black businesses from achieving their success. I mean, many of these foreign store owners would not have their businesses in the black community if it wasn't for the creation of the welfare state the removal of the father in the home, the social engineering of the single parent household, and social engineering, the idea of demonizing the black man. So if it wasn't for these concepts, we wouldn't have your black community in the state that it's in. And again, we need to have fair compensation for that. Nightingale Wednesday Nightmare, what are my thoughts on Candace Owens? Um, she's a buffer Negro. She's basically not for black people. I mean, she's a woman um, sliding with Nazis, she's not for us. So she's basic, she's another one of these buffer Negroes that is meant to stand and represent us, but is not representative of us and has no interest in representing us. She's all about making money by getting attention for white people and approval for white people. Um, Rabbi, yes, yeah, it would be equally divided and it would say, yeah, it would definitely inject growth into the economy, because yes, the cash is going to be spent. Moreover, it's going to be invested. And that's the thing that's really going to build wealth in the black community is this is going to be a major advantage because with reparations money given to black people, what it's going to do is going to bring money into the black community. And it's going to allow people to do things if they use it right, to go out here and buy homes, go out here, if it's gonna get equity with cash, there's a lot of companies, a lot of people now buying homes, it's all cash money. So they'll have cash to buy a home and then they can go out here and start things like businesses. And that's going to put money not only in the economy, but it's also going to allow people to build wealth. And it's also gonna allow them to go out here and start businesses. So that's going to be something that would really infuse the economy and it's going to build a stronger black community. Oh, we have 91 in the chat, 63 likes. Let's get those likes up. Um, if we can get 100 likes on this one, it would be amazing. Um, or even 90 likes, 75. Come on, guys. Let's get those likes up. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that, that Daryl Dale, Dale Eiffel makes a good point. Yeah, the media for generations have told white people to look down at black people. Moreover, they have taught us to look down at ourselves. And because they've taught us to look down at ourselves, we have not seen our value. We have not seen our potential. I mean, we've seen glimpses of it with guys like Michael Jordan. We've seen glimpses of it with many of these entertainers, but we have not really seen, you know, true black greatness. And that black greatness has been undermined by many of these racists out here who go out of their way to sabotage black men and black women when they're on the job or when they're trying to start a business. There have been efforts to undermine black people for over a century with things like Jim Crow, discrimination in the North, and this racism has kept black people from actualizing their potential. So when it comes down to reparations, that's about dealing with that, finally dealing with that past discrimination and dealing with that racism 
So that's what the compensation is going to be about. It's more than money. It's also about changing these policies because it's not just giving black people money for past discrimination. It is also about making sure that these policies change so that black people can actually finally get a fair and equal opportunity in these United States. I don't watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Mayhem, so I can't really um, address that. I haven't watched that in years, so I don't know. But that's par for the course as related to these shows owned by white people and create their own characters. They always want to minimize us by going out here and making the black male characters gay or making the smart male character gay. So they always do that. That's why I don't watch their content. And that's why I urge people to go pick up books like John Haynes' Dark Succubus, A Conversation with Death, or The Man Who Rules the World, because these books will give you an intelligent and positive image of a black man. Um, what Do I think Sheila Jackson Lee is sincere? No, I don't. I believe she's disingenuous because she is out here, again, bringing this farce along um, with this debate because she doesn't take it seriously. And again, they want to get this debate off the table so they can go and have the 2020 election and have the black vote sound, sewed up. So they believe if they have these hearings and tell people what they want to hear, they can pacify them and then they'll go out here and vote for whatever candidate that's out here. So what they want to do is get blacks out of the way and they believe they can get blacks out of the way with by trying to have this hearing for a hearing and then having Cory Booker say a few words to tell us what we want to hear. But you can't buy into that because that's just a complete con. Um, Governor of the Death Star, um, how far do I think Cory Booker and Bill de Blasio are going to get in the Democratic Party? I don't think either of them are going to get that far. I mean, Bill de Blasio, his record is already dead once you say one name, Eric Garner, because his ineffective handling of the Eric Garner case, the fact that Daniel Panaleo is still collecting a six-figure salary with the NYPD, is going to take him right out of the presidential campaign because he's already going to lose the black vote on that. In addition, the way he has run New York City into the ground is also another reason why Bill de Blasio has no chance because New York City is turning into a cesspool similar to what it was in 1989 because crime is going back up, the quality of life in parts of the city is going down, and he wants to do things like build homeless shelters in neighborhoods like Parkchester, and he wants to go out here and build a jail in Mott Haven, and he wants to destroy neighborhoods with his plans, and people are just going to beat the crap out of Bill de Blasio on his plans. They're going to beat him up on Eric Garner, and they're going to beat him up because He's just a very weak and ineffective leader who really is wishy-washy and soft. Not to mention, he is not a unifier because he's still feuding with Governor Andrew Cuomo right now. So Bill de Blasio is out as a presidential candidate. Even people in New York don't support him. And Cory Booker, he has no credibility because he came along during the time of Obama. And because he came along during the time of Obama, he is also seen as weak and ineffective because he basically became a senator so he could try to springboard to the president. And he wants to be another one of these presidents like Barack Obama, who is black on the outside, but still supports the same far left policies and still supports white people. So he really isn't concerned about black people. And that's something that black voters see in Cory Booker. That's why I call him Cooney Booker, because he's just a coon who buck dances for white people. So people see through both of those guys. So I don't see them getting far. I see them maybe getting one, two percent of the vote. And even in the case of Bill de Blasio, 0.5 percent, because even in New York, we don't support him as a candidate. Um, thank you, Maine, for the donation. I really appreciate it. 
Um, I'm not Rob. I yes, I would love to run for the congressional district of Alexandria Ocasio Cortez, but I haven't been here that long, and I don't have the signatures. But I would love to take her on and represent this district because she's an idiot and she doesn't really understand the needs of the people. I would love to just take her on and then take that um, seat from her because she's not representing the people the way they need to be represented. Um, Rob I.S., do you think New York will ever return to how it was in the early to mid 1980s? It's returning that way right now and your Bill de Blasio, because of Bill de Blasio's apathy, and Bill de Blasio is one of the worst mayors. I have to say he is one of the worst, but the worst um, to answer EDEC's question was Ed Koch. Ed Koch was the worst New York City mayor. He had stayed too long and he let New York fall and turn into a complete cesspool where crack dealers were literally running the city and city agencies were just sitting on their hands doing nothing and he was the worst mayor in New York City history. And that's why he lost in the primary to David Dinkins. David Dinkins was pretty incompetent, but if it wasn't for Ed Koch's policies, New York City would not have turned into a complete cesspool in the first place because he was the one who, when the crack epidemic was going on, just let these criminals literally tear the city apart. He let the school system fall into complete disrepair. I mean, the school system, I mean, the junior high schools and the high schools, you couldn't really learn anything because you feared for your life. So he was one of the worst mayors we ever had in New York City history. Um, Luciano, yeah, it would create more infrastructure because the more resources you have in a community, that means there's a stronger tax base and that allows you to build more infrastructure, that allows you to improve infrastructure, and that allows you to have a higher quality of life. Because when you have more economic resources, people can raise the standard in a community, and you can go out here, and once you have a higher standard, you can have a higher quality of life. So when you have reparations money flowing into black communities, that means the quality of life is going to improve, that means there's a higher tax base because you're having black businesses opening up and you're spending money and they're making money. So they're gonna raise the standard and they're gonna demand better libraries, better schools, better roads, and they're gonna go out here and make things clean. Um, Rob IS, um, I was five years old when the Warriors came out. And I'd have to say it's very accurate from 1979 to 1985. And during that time, again, it was really, rough out there. I mean, this was when we had all of these abandoned buildings. I mean, it looked like I lived in the Bronx at the time and my mother would walk me to school and you would walk by abandoned buildings. Um, we walked by them and it looked like a war zone. So the Warriors was fairly accurate to New York City. I've ridden on many of those graffiti trains when my we go out with my brother for Easter or we go downtown shopping. I've seen those graffiti on um, trains all sprayed up. And yeah, that was fairly accurate to New York City and at the time. Um, EDEC, what do I think New York City would have been like for black people? It would have been a much better place without the drug trade of the 80s because we would have had a foundation for black businesses. It would have been rough, but black people, I believe, would have survived because black people still had love in the early 80s. And if it wasn't for the crack epidemic of the late 80s, we wouldn't have seen the complete collapse of the black family. Because even though things were rough in the early 80s, you still had black love, you still had black families coming together, and black people still had each other. It wasn't until crack came along and we saw that generation of beta males who were so caught up in their money, they became ruthless that we started to see a complete change in things. And we saw mothers getting on these drugs. And if we didn't have the drugs in the 80s, I think black people would have tried to fight to stop the redlining in their communities. They would have been trying to get these shells of brownstones and starting to build them up. I believe they would have really gone and built up a strong community. But if it wasn't for crack and the welfare state, I believe 
that we would have had efforts to build a better black community. Um, Ace, you're gonna you can watch from the beginning. I mean, the reparations. I'm about to. I got about another thirty minutes on this one, but this you can start from the beginning um, on this on this reparations. But I was talking about you know reparations in the black community and these buffer Negroes who are trying to get in the way because right now we have this group of buffers like Tana Hishi Coates, or as I call him, to Negro Coates, because he's a fake pro black. You're Danny Glover. And then they trot out this coon and who's dancing in his draws. And they want them to be the representatives of black people. And they want them to represent the minute the um, reparations issue so they can minimize the issue. And the reason why they want to minimize the issue again is because they don't take black people seriously. But black people need to show them why they need to take them seriously by just not voting. Because when you don't vote, it sends a message to them that, okay, you don't take us seriously, then we won't take your candidates seriously so that your candidates can fall on their own. So since you don't want to represent our issues, we don't need to represent you. So, and we don't need you representing us because it's we the people who vote for you. And when it comes down to black people, we need to be more selective with who we vote for. These guys don't want to support black issues or B1 policies, then we need to be gone from them. Um, EDEC, do I, I don't fear an all conservative Supreme Court. When it comes down to the Supreme Court, they interpret the laws and the laws are created by we the people. So when it comes down to us, we have to make sure that our candidates represent us and represent the laws we want represented. And again, that's why it's important for us to understand that we need to create our platform so that our candidates represent our platform. Because in order for, because when it comes down to the Supreme Court, they only interpret the laws we create and we have to make sure we have the right candidates in place to create policies to deal with our issues like police brutality, discrimination in the job market, the underemployment of educated black people, and issues like reparations because it's all it's our candidates that will deal with these issues and it's our candidates that will create those policies that will deal with all of that oppression. Um, Ace, the um, reparations I have in mind are financial, and they're also dealing with some of these policies that are going on. And the, the, when it comes down to the financial, I believe there needs to be financial compensation. But I also believe that we need policy changes as well as related to many of these issues, like the job market and how black people have been discriminated against. I believe we need to have um, a policy as related to dealing with this police brutality, and I do need, we, we, we need reform as related to the criminal justice system so black men won't get railroaded by unethical prosecutors like Linda Fairstein or your Kevin Steele who manipulate the law in order to get a judgment or a verdict that they want to get without presenting facts based on evidence. So that's what I believe our compensation needs to be as related to things. And I also believe we need to do something about all of these white teachers teaching black children, because when you have white teachers teaching black children, they teach white supremacy to those children. And we need to make efforts to get more black teachers in classrooms. And we need to deal with the bureaucracy of white supremacy in these public schools where you have these white teachers creating fiefdoms where they try to push black teachers out and that's something we need to deal with because black kids need to have black teachers because that inspires them to go out here and see themselves as part of the community and make a contribution to black society. That's true, Nicole. They, we don't lobby for ourselves, but what we have to do is reject these fakes, fakers like Danny Glover and your... Um, 
forget his name, Ta-Nehisi Coates, who want to represent us because they don't represent us. Um, Brother Tennessee, um, do I think Booker T. Washington had a good idea? Yes, he had the best idea because if you give black people skills, they can create their own thing. But Dubois wanted to be that buffer Negro who wanted to go out here and create this elite group. But that elite group didn't come back to the black community. All they wanted was white validation and approval. And they derailed the overall black community. So Booker's idea was the best idea, but, but he got shouted down by your W.E.B. Du Bois, who was just a buffer Negro. Because if you read, I believe it was Souls of Black Folk, well, one of them. It's in three Negro classics. Um, he was all about this talented 10th, but that talented 10th was all about white approval and not about black empowerment. Um, Edek, what makes Danny Glover a fraud on the issue of reparations for black Americans? He is not qualified to speak on that issue. And the reason why he's not qualified to speak on that issue is because he has received so many benefits from being an actor. So he cannot come in and speak on the issue of reparations. I mean, he does not have the historical background. He is not an expert on the history of black people, the way um, Thomas Sowell is. He's not an a expert on economics, the way Dr. Claude Anderson is. He is not an expert in any way, shape, or form who can present a constructive discourse on the issue of reparations, and we needed to have a qualified individual who understood these issues. I mean, people like Claude Anderson, people like um, Thomas Sowell, people like, um, there's another economist, um, but we need people who understand economics, we need people who understand history, and we need people who understand the issue who can present an argument to black about black um, discrimination for decades, racism, slavery, and present it in a constructive fashion. So we needed that type of individual to present the argument, not some Hollywood entertainer who has benefited from the system, has gotten rich from the system, and has not really suffered outside of being racially profiled outside of the supermarket, he can't really articulate the systemic issues as related to race so, and how black people have been denied an equal opportunity here in America. And we can't, he can't articulate the discussion at all, so. Um, Nightingale Wednesday Nightmare, that's what my family member who worked in education told me. Um, she said that there are a lot of white female teachers, yeah, they think they can control black children. Yeah, they and a lot of them think because they have biracial children, they have that right. But no, you don't really understand the black experience. You don't understand black culture. And you don't really understand what these kids are going through. And when you come into the classroom, when you have that white skin, what they do is people submit to you immediately because they see your white skin as authority. And that's what mentally messes those kids up because if that white person says your kid is stupid, they'll sit there and believe it. I remember being in a third grade class. Um, one of my teachers said that I was retarded and then every kid in that class since then believed that and I couldn't prove it to anyone all because this white female told them. Um, Governor of the Death Star, I don't believe we will be at war with Iran because when it comes down to war, Americans have had enough of war. I mean, we've been in war in Afghanistan for 20 years. We've been in war with Iraq for 17 years. American military is already spread too thin as it is. And we just don't have the manpower to have another war with another country, nor do people have an interest in getting in a war with Iran because we just don't have the manpower. We don't have the resources. It's a lot like the Roman Empire right now. And when your military is spread too thin and then you don't have people being able to be recruited because we've raised a generation of manginas, a raised generation of soy boys, and these people are were more self-destructive. So they don't have the they don't have the people who have the discipline to be soldiers. So this is a this would be a disaster to start a war with Iran. 
And if Trump started a war with Iran, he would actually lose the election. It's just not an effective strategy because they haven't really done anything at all. I'd have to say Trump is more of a Nero on Wise Guy Joe, but when it comes down to America, America has no leadership. It has no direction. And that's one of the big problems. That's why Trump got elected is because nobody has a vision for where they want to take the country. Um, when it comes down to America, people really don't know where they want to go. Um, we have all this technology, we have all these resources, but because people are comfortable, they no longer want to compete. And because they don't want to compete, they can't set a course for their lives. So we have a big problem here in America in that Americans, they just don't know where they want to go and they want to blame everybody for their problems when the problem has always been we the people. Trump, as I've said, can't make America great again because Americans don't want to be great. They don't want to take risks. They don't want to fail. They don't want to try. And they're just so comfortable and they don't want to go anywhere. They don't see, they don't have a vision for where they want to go. And they want to sit there and say that it's this group, it's that group. And it's actually, they just don't want to be responsible for themselves. And they want somebody else to blame for their problems. But then they don't want to go out here and take that responsibility. Um, Nightingale Wednesday Nightmare, yeah, I believe America will fall like the Roman Empire um, because when you have people who are comfortable, they take their society for granted. And that's what I'm seeing with a lot of these social justice warriors. That's what I'm seeing with a lot of these feminists. That's what I'm seeing a lot of these beta males. They take their society for granted. They don't appreciate their society. They don't appreciate their constitution because they didn't have to work for anything. And they feel no incentive to be a part of anything because of the way things are. So what's happening now is people are, they have, they're just really apathetic and they really don't feel a connection to their country. And that's what happened in the Roman Empire. People didn't really feel a concern for anything. They didn't care about anything. And it's all about them getting their way instead of them trying to compromise to keep the country great or making efforts to innovate things. Because when a lot of these corporations, they're just about keeping the status quo. Because when you look at Hollywood, it's all about giving people the same shows that they made 30 years ago and not taking any risks. So everybody wants to be safe, but nobody understands that in order to grow something, you have to go out here and let something go. Because in order to get something, you have to sacrifice something. And that's something I learned, again, when I was um, hired, looking to hire Bill Welko to do the cover for Isis Wrath of the Cyber Goddess. In order for me to get this cover, I had to sacrifice a lot of toys in my toy collection, a lot of old toy catalogs, even a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle pie wrapper in order to get the money to pay for this cover. And in order to get something, you have to let something go. And I had to let go of a lot of stuff in order to get this cover and move the SJS Direct imprint forward. And that's something people don't understand out here. They're thinking that they can just get something by just showing up. And that's not how the world works. And, and you're going to deal with a lot of resistance, a lot of people saying no. And this is something that your SJWs don't understand. This is what many people don't get. They're expecting to get things through just showing up and feeling they're entitled to something. And this is a big problem with most Americans is that they want greatness, but then they don't want to go through the pain to be a great person, because in order to go, go become a great person, you're going to have to deal with a lot of no, you're going to have to deal with a lot of people not liking what you produce, you're going to have to deal with a lot of people hating you, and you're going to have to deal with a lot of people just plain hating you, and you're going to have to persevere in the face of that adversity, and when it comes down to people, they don't want to deal, whenever they deal with any sort of thing that they have to disagree, that people disagreeing with them, they just do like what the Facebook owner is doing, try to silence them, or what they try to do, like with YouTube, is try to take all those 
types of content down. And when you do that, it shows that you don't have any sort of grip or any sort of resolve because people who have grit and resolve, they go out here and they they can take it. I mean, they can take stuff. Um, thank you, Bloodsport One, for coming to the stream. And I also thank you for buying Dark Succubus. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy Dark Succubus because I put a lot of work into that one. And I'm working on the next John Hayes book, which is The Man with Nothing to Lose. I just finished Isis, the main event, um, this week. And I'm hoping to start back work on Eternal Night, which is going to be a black goth vampire story. So I have a lot of projects I'm trying to get ready for 2020. And the 2019 books are up now, and you can pick those up again. That was Dark Succubus, which is available on Amazon right now. Um, Esteem Goddess of, and Isis, All That Glitters. All these are now available on Amazon in paperback. And they're available on Kindle Unlimited. And if you have a Kindle Unlimited sub, you can read all three of these books for free. Um, right now, Bloodsport, yeah, I really want to get the ISIS graphic novel out. And I just need the donations to do that. So everybody who donates a dollar, that helps because I have almost 11,000 subs. If we all donated a dollar, that would help me get the graphic novel out there. I've got enough money for a couple of pages, but I'm trying to make sure I can get enough for the... Other for one story, but I want to try to get enough money for the main story before I go talk to Bill Walker again because I want to make sure that he is um, paid in full for the art before I go out here and launch. So I want to make sure that the art is paid for. Then I can try to focus on the coloring, and I need to be at least about 9300 in order to get the art paid for. So I've got a long way to go, but I'm trying to get there. Um, thank you, William, for sharing the stream on the Facebook on your Facebook page. I really appreciate it. Um, that means a lot to me. But when it comes down to, I can't speak on Chicago, John. Right? You have to talk to Mr. Superboy. He lives there, so he can talk more about Chicago's cops than I can. I can talk about New York cops, but a, Mr. Superboy would be the expert you would talk to about that. Which Mr. Superboy would do a stream, but he doesn't do streams. He does videos. Um, but I think he would do very well with streams. And Luciano, will reparations help with education? Yes, they will definitely help because, again, when you pour resources into a community, that increases the tax base, and that also means more money for schools, and it also means that those black people in the community will start demanding black teachers if they are smart. They'll sit there and say, look, we've got these resources, but we also need black teachers teachers to teach our kids. And um, One Force Balance, I did a video about Finn on um, The Last Jedi uh, a couple of months ago where I talked about Finn being a bumbling, stumbling minstrel. I did that video. Uh, you have to search for it or I'll see if I can search for it. Wait a minute. Here it is. Yeah, he's called Finn the Butler, Star Wars, The Racism Awakens. So you can pick that one up. You can watch that one. It's I left the link in the chat for you, One Force Balance. Um, yeah, I, I did do a video on Finn. I call him Finn the Butler. And I roast up Finn because he is not a positive image of black men. Okay. Thank you, Brother Tennessee, for picking up Dark Succubus. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, but I would take money because I could use money to buy real estate. And that's what I would take because with money, you can go out here and you can buy the resources that you need. And that's what people are going to get because when it comes on to real estate here in America, 
yeah, a lot of areas are bought up. So you, with money, you can go out here and you can either take your money and invest it in the U.S. or you can take your money and move abroad. So that gives you a lot of options you wouldn't get any place else. So that's that's something I would take if I were to get reparations. Um, Nightingale Wednesday Nightmare. I don't believe 2020 is going to be like George Orwell's 84, because when it came down to the 2016 election, I don't believe it was de decided by YouTube or Google. I believe it was decided because of white women. And what they're trying to do is trying to manipulate the masses into believing that Google and YouTube have this um, control over people by trying to flag the channels of conservatives and trying to flag the channels of black people. But they're going to be in for a rude awakening because it was the 60% of white women who voted for Trump, even though he said you could grab them by their private parts. And that was due to hypergamy and these women looking to protect their access to resources. Because when it came down to Hillary Clinton, that would lead to equality. And most hypergamous females did not want to be equal, nor did they want to be held responsible under a female president. Because a female president means that women would have to take responsibility for themselves. They would have to be equal to men. So that's why that 60% of white women voted for Trump. And this is the thing that the Democrats don't understand is that Hillary Clinton didn't lose to Donald Trump because um, of the internet or conservative bloggers or conservative YouTubers, Hillary Clinton lost because of female nature. Because again, when fe women are out here, they want to protect their access to resources and they get their resources from men and those men make those women secure. So they want security. So that's why they voted for Donald Trump. And Donald Trump has been an extremely gynocentric president. So that's why Hillary Clinton lost. And the Democrats just can't seem to register this because they just don't understand logic. They sit there and they're still thinking that um, Donald Trump won because of the internet. And they're trying to censor the internet, thinking that the internet and guys were influential. You got Mark Zuckerberg thinking Facebook was influential. And was, no, it wasn't any of that. Those white women were never going to vote for a white woman because they don't want equality because a female president means that men are going to make them take responsibility for themselves. And that's what's happening with the Me Too movement and the complete backlash going on right now. You have so many women out here they're, being, they're, they're feeling that backlash because now they have to carry their own weight because men aren't helping them. And that's what these people, like the heads of YouTube and Google, don't understand about the um, 2016 election. And it's going to cost them 2020 overall. Yeah, Mr. Superboy's channel is called Your World, and you definitely need to check that one out. It's one of the best channels on YouTube. And they're thinking that they can change the programming, but people have been resisting and all of this woke attempts has just been pushing back. I mean, the whole Steven Crowder thing made Crowder more popular. When they try to censor people, it made them more popular. And these attempts to take shots at Donald Trump only made Donald Trump more popular. And even John Wright is right. Yeah, and their attempts to try to censor people only led to the revelation of more racist cops on Facebook. And I'd say a billion dollars a person, Brother Tennessee, would be a good story as related to reparations. Um, books that I would recommend for financial information, uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill is a good one to start with. Ace, that's a good one. I don't know about that lift every voice. I don't think you can lock up a per, uh, descendant for the crimes that their ancestors did. 
Um, Bloodsport, what are my opinion on automations? I'm not a fan of automation because I've been in stores with automation. And usually it's, it winds up hurting a business when you have automation. I've been to McDonald's where they have the automated kiosks and you really don't get the service you need. I had one time where receipt didn't print and it's not really good. It just takes jobs out of the community and you also get even poorer quality service. So in the attempt to save money, it winds up costing a business more money and it's just cheaper to hire good employees because there's nothing more valuable than a good employee. This thinking, um, what is it? Um, um, Ace, it's called Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I'm going to try to look it up on Amazon for you. Okay, I'm going to try to... Oh, it's not letting me do it. Crap. But it's on Amazon. I will... Um, let me see. I can do it. But that's the title of it. Um, Why do black women hate men going their own way so much? Because... They can't get access to resources from those men, and they can't get the attention from those men. Because once those men walk away, these women don't have anything to bargain with, and they don't have anybody to negotiate with. And men who are going their own way, they are, are no longer on the table to be viable partners. So that's why black women hate men who go their own way. And they can't get access to their attention their resources and their time. So that's why they hate them because they know they'll never get an opportunity at them. They'll have to deal with Pookie and Ray Ray. So men who are not on the table are men they can't get access to. So that's why you have so many people hating um, the men who go their own way. And that's why they don't want anything to do with them. Um, but that's why they hate them because they don't want them to teach other men because they know the more and more men who walk away from the table, and that's what's happening right now, men are walking away from the table, so they can't get access to those guys. Um, I don't know if patriotism, patriotism Luciano, I don't think can um cure racism because racism is a part of gynocentrism and when the big problem with racism is it's a gynocentric construct it's about men going out here and hating another man because they fear that that man will get attention from their, the women in their community and they fear competing with that man for the attention of their women so when it comes down to racism a lot of people they look at it as something from hate, but they have to understand why these guys hate. And they hate because they don't want to compete with black men for the attention of the women in the community. Because those women, they fear if those women get are corrupted, they will start learning a black culture and teach a black culture to their children. And they don't they want in order to keep their seed going on, they need to eliminate those other men by teaching the women to hate that man. Okay, I'm going to get ready to wrap the stream up in about a minute. Um, but when it comes down to reparations, this is a very serious issue. And again, the government seems like it's not taking the issue very seriously. And if they're sitting there and making a joke of it, again, we need to show them how serious it is by not participating in the 2020 election and send a message to many of these politicians, that if they want to deal with black people, they're going to have to deal with the issue of reparations. And if they're going to deal with this issue of reparations, 
they need to show us how they're going to support intelligent black people by presenting our best experts to on a forum because Danny Glover and Tony Hishi Coates do not represent the black community. Neither does that buck dancing minstrel they had who was act dancing in his underwear or neither is a brain damaged football player. If you really want to start talking about reparations and get serious about it, we need to see a black, a, Congression, not a hearing of a hearing to just get the matter discussed. We need to see a serious and constructive discussion on reparations where we go out here and we see you having a discussion with our top experts in the field. People, again, like Claude Anderson, Dr. Thomas Sowell, and others who are experts on economics race relations, the history of racism, the history of gynocentrism, the history of feminism, and the issues as related to the black community. So that's why I want to see have that discussion. I would love to see YouTubers like David Carroll on that panel. I would like to see Mr. Superboy on that panel. I would love to see um, Professor Black Truth come out and talk on that panel because I believe that we need to have these kind of guys talking about this issue in a constructive because then it would be seen as something serious and it would be seen as something constructive and we would get a serious discussion on the issue. Now, I thank everybody for coming to the live stream. I really appreciate you guys coming to the live stream. And I would really appreciate you guys going out of your way to support my books on the SJS Direct imprint for the 2019 catalog, like John Haynes' Dark Succubus. I would appreciate if you guys picked up the paperback and or the Kindle format, um, East Team Goddess of, which came out the month after, before John Haynes' Dark Succubus or Isis All That Glitters, or you, if you could pick up um, books like Isis Wrath of the Cyber Goddess, I would really appreciate it if you guys would go out of your way to head over to Amazon and pick up all of those books, or to go out here and donate to the Patreon so I could um, rob IS. The paperbacks for Isis series books are usually about $8.99 to $7.99, um, but when it comes down to Dark Succubus, says $7.99 for the paperback. East Team Goddess of $7.99. And Isis All That Glitters is $7.99. And the ebooks are $3.99. So if you guys would go out here and pick up the books, I would really appreciate it. It would help me a long way. And I'm hoping to, um, Luciano, you can pick up my ebook, Why 70% why of Black Women are single to understand black feminism, but I really would appreciate you guys picking up the books. That really helps with my book sales. It also helps get the word out about my books. I really would appreciate it if you guys would tell more people about my books because the more people who pick up SJS to read books, the more the imprint grows. And then I can go out here and hire more black artists to do things like graphic novels or do covers or do different types of projects. So again, I really appreciate you guys coming out to the stream. I appreciate you guys supporting my work. And I thank you for taking time to spend with me to discuss reparations. And I hope to be back this Wednesday with another live stream. And I hope you'll be there for that live stream on Wednesday. Thank you, Rudy, for coming in too. <laughs> Glad to see you here. <laughs>